sometimes. You know the problem is with overflowing? It goes to other people. Well, no, it just it spills all over the place, and you know, and then you got kind of a mess. <laughs> I don't know. Do you ever do you ever think about holy messes? Yes. <laughs> you know, I am a holy mess. You know, is that okay to say? Yeah. Yeah, like I'm a holy mess. <laughs> holy mess. You know, like a whole almost sounds like holiness. <laughs> no, sorry. What were you gonna say? Like a whole piece, like a whole pie. Like a whole pie. I like pies. I, li I like that idea. <laughs> I'm go with that. Um, do you, you want to talk any more about the, those words and the dream? I wouldn't mind knowing what your view is of um, <laughs> men leading uh, family. <laughs> well, <laughs> men leading family. I thought you were going to ask me to interpret the dream. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do not have the gift of interpreting dreams, <laughs> especially in front of crowds of uh, 44 men. Uh, or at least I'll try at all possible lengths to delay that so I can no, think I about just, it. I, just, <laughs> I, I just, uh, you know, when we started, uh, I'll, I'm going to be long-winded in answering that, okay? Because I, I got to think about it while I, you know, so I'm, I'm buying myself a little time here while I'm uh, thinking about that. When you mentioned the apple pie, the good thing about that way. <laughs> When you cook an apple pie in the oven from fresh, it bubbles over, just like you said, a holy mess. And the pie does, the filling tends to bubble over. I'm the one who cleans the oven after that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yep. We actually now have someone, someone gave us one of those ovens that you don't have to clean anymore. But I still am the one who gets all the ashes off the bottom. So, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, thank you. You gave me a little bit more time, too. <laughs> When we started to, uh, this weekend, Duncan got up and shared something. I was over here fiddling with my technology. I had my back in. Seriously. Like, that's what was happening when Duncan was sharing. I was, was distracted and involved in something else. And I was hearing him, but I couldn't see what was going on here. I was over here. And uh, Gord, who I've had the pleasure of meeting, uh, he got up and went over and hugged Duncan. And you guys all saw that, right? Yeah. That was cool. I mean, I just, that was a prophetic act in my book. I'm going to get woo woo on you here now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was good. But that was a prophetic act. There's something about what he did that was a connection between him and Duncan. May I share a little bit more? Yes. Okay. And what happened is, like Duncan and I are friends, good friends. And uh, we've walked together for a while. We've done a fair bit together, we've shared a fair bit together. And uh, for him to do what he did, I didn't have to, it's not that I shouldn't have been giving him my full attention when he did what he did, but I didn't have to hear or see him hear and know how much that meant and how courageous an act that was. Duncan didn't know I was going to share this. I hope you don't mind sharing <laughs> but, but it. <laughs> I'm going to get a later maybe here. <laughs> I, I'll take it. I'll take it. So, but you know, the, my point was not to, to um, uh, highlight or, or put a spotlight on these two guys. It was just to say those who, for me, who's gotten to know a little bit, very little bit of Gord, and then, and then for them to end up out on a bench last night while the groups were starting, and for them to bless each other, and I'm not going to go into the details, but to be a blessing to each other out there on the bench was just a picture of what I'm trying to get at and what I think is going on in your fellowship and is going on here this weekend. Just a little bit of it, you know? Is that fair? Yeah, it's good. Great. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? So that's precious. You know, and I, you know, I I just I've heard things in terms of what was going on in the groups and from individual men here this weekend that have told me that, you know. In terms of that prophecy and in terms of your question, okay, 
Here's what I'll do. I'll just read this. I was going to read this later, but I'm going to read it now. Mm -hmm. This is a, a second book uh, in the Life Model series. It's called Living with Men. This is the one with the picture of the guy with the pacifier mm -hmm. in his mouth and the little baby he's holding. He's going, what? That's my pacifier. Right? Anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. But let's get on with it. <coughs> See if I can find it real quick. Tell me where. If I can't, I'm just going to paraphrase it. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> there are two major reasons why men have not progressed to adult maturity. First, they lack the preparation and the training. You have to have preparation and training to play golf. You have to have preparation and training to wield a sword. The weapons of our warfare are not eternal, but to God. to down the strongholds. So we gotta we gotta know how to do that though. We gotta know. Uh, you can you know you can quote you can quote a great golfer on how to golf, but man, if you get out there and try and hit that little sucker. <laughs> You get humbled real quick. <laughs> Come on. If you play, you know that's true. There are two major reasons why men have not progressed to adult maturity. First, they lack the preparation and training needed. They have addressed, we have addressed in this book, <laughs> what men, men need to mature. And we've talked a little smattering of that. I've given you a, maybe just a little taste of it here this weekend. And they've done that extensively in this book. They get it in, into it even deeper than the life model, that little, that little book that we've gone through, that study book. That little book that's so big is what I like to say. But the second reason that men do not mature is that they need healing. And I'm not talking about shukataka barabandiyaha. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people <coughs> living in community with each other, going out on the, on the bench together, frustrated or crying or happy or whatever, and sharing that with each other. And, and men that have maturity, downloading it to men who don't, and men who don't, receiving it and giving it to other men. And I'm talking about a lifetime. It doesn't happen at the McDonald's window, or the Tim Hortons window. This is a, a lifetime of building, developing. <laughs> Am I talking too loud? No. 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 Keep it up. <laughs> I came from a Baptist background. I've been an ordained minister since 2000. I know about charismania. I know about Pentecostalism. I know about, you know, I can. I, I haven't been to a cemetery, I mean a seminary, but um, I, I know about that stuff. I, I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have said that. No, I'm sorry. No, no, you know, there's a lot of really good learning places, and they, they've provided a lot of good, uh, uh, a lot of good wisdom and understanding and fathering for men. So I, I need to watch my mouth. So. But, you know, I did have something I was wanting to say there. And I think it really is that we just need a lot of time to grow. And when I ask you in that questionnaire whether you're emo you think you're emotionally mature, with all due respect, I think a lot of us think we're a lot more emotionally mature than we are. May I say that? Six. And those who are emotionally mature, um, you, you really know who they are. They, they stand out in a crowd. And usually they've got guys coming to them. They don't need a title, elder or leader. People come to them because it's like, you know, a moth to light. You know, we just, we're attracted to them. Because we can see Jesus in them. You know? And they're usually very unassuming, very in the background. They have to be because otherwise they get trampled. 
a lot of them know that. And, and often, they're busy. You know, not in a bad way. They're busy fathering other guys and helping them. But, you know, this has been a problem ever since Paul was writing these letters. Because he says, you've got many leaders. Right? Remember that part? Yeah. He says, you've got many leaders, but you have few fathers. <clears throat> That's because there's lots of kids running around in adult bodies. And I'm not trying to <coughs> shame you with this. I'm trying to say a lot of us don't realize the holes there are in our maturity. When I when I clicked that spam email, what did it say about me? Did it say that I was a dirty, rotten porn user? Well, I thought it did. But what did it really say about me? That you had a need. That I had needs, plural. I had I had many needs, and they been needs that I had, some of them I was aware of, but some of them I had uh, gone down the long hall, opened the closet door, pushed them in a long time ago, triple locked it, and ignored the blood that was coming out underneath onto the hallway. And some of them were in closets I didn't even know were there. And there probably still is some of that. And that's okay. Because I've got relationships now, and I've got people in my life, and I've got connectedness with God to a degree, to a degree, that I'm able to walk that out and have a confidence that it's going to be all right. And I've had to have guys and and gals and ladies, spiritual moms, who be able to look me in the eye and say, you know, it's going to be all right. Sometimes that's all we need. When it's sincere, and we can tell they know what they're talking about. <laughs> Sometimes that's all we need to hear, is you know it really is going to be all right. And then, if those people are willing to say that to us, <clears throat> what I really needed is what. With those spiritual moms and dads who said that to me, what what's my heart been looking for when they said, you know, it's going to be all right. Those things, those things, but I've, I've needed relationship with them to walk it out with me and help it to be all right. Now, not everybody can do that, you know. I can talk about these things here. I'm not going to be able to do that with all you guys. But when I say that in a counseling session, I'm committing myself to walking that out with that person. So the great, greatest degree God will allow me to. I'm not talking about not having boundaries. I'm not talking about letting them have access to me 24-7. And some people can do more of that than I can. I still have two uh, young uh, adult daughters at home that I'm raising, trying to raise in maturity with my wife. But can you hear me? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Just felt like I needed to say that. That uh, and and you know so. In a deck, I'm just going to read uh, one more one more uh, sentence or two here, and then I'm going to answer, try to answer that question. In addition to the lack of the necessary good things in life, remember a trauma, absence trauma, absence trauma. Men must also attend to the damage caused by the genuinely bad things that have happened to them as they grew up. Some of this damage was self-inflicted through ignorance or perversity. Some was accidental, and some was just evil. Men must have healing from these injuries before they can go on with normal growth and maturity. And that healing isn't just praying at the front and having prophetic words. That healing involves maybe putting a second mortgage on your home and spending $5,000 a year for a couple of years to get some really good professional help. I know that sounds ridiculous. But I know people who have done that. I know people who have been in counseling that have needed to be in counseling for severe trauma from their childhoods for literally 10 to 20 years. 
You say, that's crazy, Dave. You are just psycho babbling. You don't know what's out there. You don't know. Some of you don't know. Some of you do know. The evil that's been perpetrated against people and the level of support and encouragement, they won't even go into church. 50% of the Christians who come to me for counseling on my 15-page questionnaire from heaven, as opposed to hell, <laughs> they won't let me talk to their pastors or to their leaders. That's a shame. I wish that wasn't true. Their trust level is so broken. They, they have a hard time. They're, they're sweating buckets coming in to see me for the first time. Scared about what's going to happen, what I'm going to do, what I'm not going to do. <coughs> Some of you guys feel like that just coming in. I know I, sometimes I feel like that coming to a group of guys for a conference or for a meeting where I know there's going to be opportunity for intimacy and emotional connection. And I'm, I'm afraid. I still have elements of that wound of fear of rejection. Tell me no one else can relate to that here. I know you can because I've talked to some of you. So, what about men and women? What about um, relationships and, and a prophecy like that? Well, how can I be a man, Dane, if I'm still a boy inside? How can I be a father and help those beautiful young little kids of mine spin their little plates. I'm still struggling to keep mine spinning 24 7. Like, I don't know how many. Uh, have, has any of your wives ever said, sometimes I feel more like a mom to you than a, than a wife? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have it in the right room. Yeah, no, that's good. I feel a lot more. Four kids. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah, so, what does that say about us as men? Am I being too hard on you? No, no preach no. it, Dave. Come on, preach it. I don't want to preach <laughs> I just want to be up here and be real and share. You know, if that's preaching, that's a good thing. But for me, preaching is is me, you know, is, is, is the jolly green giant giving peace to peons. You know, and I'm, I'm not, I'm sorry, I said cemetery and now I'm on preaching and I... I I'm sorry, but I, I don't see, that's not who I am. I'm not a preacher. I'm an exhorter. And all I can do is try to be real about who I am here and encourage you guys to share who you are with each other, which has happened this weekend, and tell you about a great resource, one of the great resources I found, Life Model, that's helped some of the guys in your fellowship, and that's why I'm here. So what you're, what you're saying to me, or what I'm hearing is that I need to learn how to, to sort of take care of myself. That's that child level maturity. If you can get to the point where you've learned to take care of yourself, you've got to the end of child level yeah. emotional maturity. And now I'm able to take care of someone else, my wife. Begin to learn. Begin to learn. <laughs> That's good. Still a teenager. Begin. <laughs> begin. Begin. Uh, that was a, there was a gray haired man in the back that said, That's a good point. Like some of us who have gray hair have some of that adult level maturity and we understand how hard it is to take care of yourself and, and not regret saying things, right? Like that's the test. The test is, is when I come home after a really tough week on Friday, right? I don't know if you've got any of this imagery, but I'll give you some of mine and maybe you've heard this kind of stuff. But I have to learn on that drive home, or see, I commute my socks. Like I work at home, right? So I have to, I have to, I have to walk upstairs, right? I have to walk upstairs. By the time I get upstairs, come on, walk with me, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So I have to have my bow on my sword. I have to have my bow on, on, unstrung, and I have to have my sword left at the at the threshold of the door that I'm walking into where my family is. Do you understand that imagery? Yeah. When I'm out there, I'm battling. I don't know if that's weird or not for you, but I feel like I'm battling. Sometimes when I do this kind of stuff, I feel like I'm battling. But I have to lay all that stuff down when I get home. And I have to be there. When I walk in the door, 
No one brings me my slippers and the newspaper and my pipe. When I was when I was raising kids, I was I was responsible to take care of those four kids. It, it got to the point where it was four. And 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 know that it would be a loving thing, and it was not done out of it was really done out of love, out of my heart, that I, I needed to be there for my wife and my kids. I didn't get to rest when I walked in the door. So I, I, put, I built a cushion into my day so that when I, I try to build a cushion into my day, hear me, so that when I get home, I used to have a half an hour commute. I literally used to, uh, this isn't back in the bag phone days, I know I'm dating myself, but I, I, would, I would stop on, uh, on Cossuth Road uh, from Guelph to Kitchener, and I would just fall asleep. And I'd, I'd fall asleep for 10 or 15 minutes, sometimes too long, and the phone would ring, and guess who it was? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. She was wondering, you know, like, Dave, step up. She didn't say that to me, but that's what I felt like the Spirit of God saying. <clears throat> and I had a lot of help in those years, in that, those 21 years I lived in the Christian community, and I learned a lot about being a man. But there were still big holes in my maturity that didn't get exposed until I was under the pressure of having worked for 11 years for the government, making a really good salary, having really good benefits, and then having to face God saying, now it's time, you need to go down with the boat and start doing what's been your heart to do, Christian counseling. I went from earning a huge salary to less than 20000 a year the first, the first year I went into, uh, I was the maintenance man for our apartment building so that we would have free rent so that I could do what I was doing that first year. So, but, you know, like, I, so that was God teaching me to do hard things, right? Even in the midst of my failure uh, and my, my, my sexual, uh, my, my lustful uh, downfall. And I, I just think, you know, this is, this is what I'm trying to share here this weekend is is that we as men we get into those positions like that and we just uh, we fold we fold we you know we don't know how to lay down our weapons at the door we don't know how to be there for our wives and so we wear them as burdens right our, Jesus says in this world you will have trouble but Take heart. I've overcome the world. So, when there's enough of Jesus in a man, he carries that same, that same spirit and that same heart. And that's what he shares with the guys that be fathers and brothers and the brother him and father him. That kind of a spirit, right? Like where you, you just somehow, God becomes our refuge. You know, you're a strong tower into, uh, in, into whom I run, and I am safe. Well, that doesn't mean physical safety. People get crucified. <coughs> people, people get murdered for their faith, for standing up for their faith. People, people, it, it, you know, Paul talks about all the things that he faced in being who he was in Christ. But then, at the same time, he's saying he's safe. Well, how is he safe? If, how is that scripture even true? That's not a rhetorical question. How can that be true? What's safe in him, in Christ? What's safe for us? Where do we need to find our safety? What is that part of us that's safe in him? Our soul. Your is it our soul? Your identity. Safety is another word for security, right? And what is it? What's, so, what, so if we could give... I, 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 I mean, the purpose. Who you are. Our, our true being. Our, I would say our hearts. That part of us that lives on. You know, and our souls, I don't know if our souls are ever going to be safe here on earth. There's scriptures that say that we need to protect our hearts. Right? We're going to get hurt here. We're going to be scared. We're going to be angry. But God's redeeming that. You know, he's restoring our souls. 
But in the meantime, we need to learn to have the safety in Christ. And the safety that comes with the love of Christ that is in us. Right? And that's what we're to have to extend to others, to our wives. Right? We're to live in peace with all men if it's all if it at all possible. Yeah. I like I like uh, that one. Sorry, so Yeah, I was just gonna what I'm hearing from you, Dave, is that you know, when we first get saved, our spirits are instantly reborn. They're regenerated, they're remade new. Our spirits but, are. But the soul is not. That's true. You know what I mean? And there's That's so true. baggage and wounding that it's that part that needs to be addressed and healed. That's how I look at it. Yeah. And our souls and our spirits could be wounded. Not just our souls, but our spirits. I mean, we're dividing ourselves up into three parts so we can talk about it here. Mm -hmm. This is this is purely, I'm going to use a, you know, a big word here, but it, it's purely for the purposes of teaching. It's didactic. Who here can separate himself into three parts? It's so, you know, it's like Holy Spirit, God, and, and Jesus. Like, they are, they are one. And we try to talk about it and figure all that out, but it's hard. Right? You can tell I'm not a theologian. But, you know, I just think, I, I think it's, it's the mystery of Jesus and the church is what? Come on, what does, wait, in Ephesians, what does Paul say that the mystery of Jesus and the church is like? Husband and wife, marriage. It's a mystery. Body, soul, and spirit, to me, in a lot of ways, is a mystery. This relationship between husband and wife. And you know what? We as men need to get on, down on our knees. We as leaders, male leaders in the church, need to get down on our knees and say, I am so sorry for how we have boarded our maleness, our channel one maleness over <clears throat> you, for this, the whole, for as long as it's been going. Women need us to be who God made us to be. And identity is the issue. And we, you know, I, there's this song I love. I don't know, maybe I can play it here, like through my iTunes, if, if I can flip, uh, flick it in. I, I'll try to do that before we end here. But it's this song, and uh, it's by this guy in New York, who's this, uh, not that well-known worship leader, but it's called Remind Me Who I Am. Some of you might know it. But it is such an incredible song. And Jason Gray. Jason Gray. Jason Gray. And uh, uh, he's from Mid-State, New York, where I grew up. And uh, uh, he's quite the uh, psalmist and minstrel kind of dude. And you know, he, he just went viral with this this song on uh, on YouTube. And uh, and it just speaks to men so deeply. It speaks to women too. But you know. It's like, what I wanted from my father and what I love hearing from my heavenly father is who I am. My dad didn't tell me that. My dad didn't have a dad and told him who he was. At 21 years, when I had a spiritual father, a spiritual dad, like I just soaked it up. I told you, it became idolatry, that relationship. But there was a lot of it that was good, too. There's a lot about our relationships with our parents, even though they may have been in some ways abusive or, or you know, in the B trauma, bad stuff kind of way, or a, uh, abusive and traumatizing in the A trauma kind of way, where they didn't supply us with stuff, God still used them in ways that, that has blessed us, many of us. Some of us not, but many of us. I used to always struggle with that verse that says, honor your father and your mother. And, and like a lot of verses in Christian circles, you know, we, we really like to sometimes, don't we, with our, with our verses, we like to, I was talking to a few people about this this weekend, we like to control people. We like to keep them under control with fear bonds related to the Bible. 
right? We like to control our families as fathers with our anger and with our disapproval or with our, our lack. We withdraw our love from our families, whether we realize it or not. But that's not, that's, that's not the spirit of Christ. So if, if you guys could have your druthers, what would you like me to do? Would you like me to give you, now that it's working, please God. Um, <laughs> I'm saying that in faith here. Um, do, you want, do you want me to give you, if I can, this probably 10 to 15 minute pre presentation of the basics, a summary of the life model so that you can know what it's about? Please do. You want me to try and do that? And if it doesn't work, what would you like to do? Hear about the eight ways to joy. Okay. I can do that without the without the pressing easily. Anything else? I'm here for you. So if there's something that you want to hear, I know you don't know what you don't know to ask me about because you haven't seen the whole and you haven't read necessarily the book, but to the work that would be good because then you know people can see what, what they may be interested in signing up for. Okay. I'll do it whether I have the present or not. <laughs> Let there be present. Let there be present. So while it's either going or not going, I'm, I'm on the clock now, so I'm just going to go myself, right? And if it, if it goes, I'll use it, and if it doesn't, I'll just keep going, all right? This is going to be too hard. I'm just going to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use, uh, I'm just going to use the six chapters, and I'm just going to tell you briefly the, the important points, and we've already talked about some of them. So, so the, the first chapter is basically saying, counseling is not enough. Don't come and seek me if you think I'm going to heal you with Jesus' help. Because I can't. Oh, sure. He got it. Sure. He's gone. Yay. So, isn't it wonderful? So, that, you know, we'll, we'll start with what Bruce asked. We'll start, and I don't know if this is if you're going to be able to see this or not. It'll get bigger, That's and good. I can That's and good. I can manipulate it. That's but here's the kind of things that you can do. That's pretty small. Can you see it? Yeah. One no. One more. Okay. Well, how about well, how about like two or three at a time? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Is that good in the back? Yeah, that's good. good. All right, yeah. You took on that little uh, square in the bottom corner. It's always good when it gets together and helps. Oh, maybe that small little one. I'm trying here. Prezi is just, you know, not not liking me this this weekend. All right. So anyway, so we've already talked about the first one, right? Yeah. Okay. So the second one, we already talked a little bit about that. But these things are common sense. But you know, like uh, uh, a friend of mine who's uh, one of the 570 announcers on you know on talk radio and occasionally there uh, likes to say common sense isn't very common. That's right. But this is what we got to learn to do. Our wives are really good at this stuff. A lot of them, a lot of the women we know are, are pretty good at this stuff. They're a lot more relational. They understand this stuff a lot better than we do. But this is what connection looks like. This is what builds joy. Ask questions and invite others to share honestly how they're doing and what they're thinking. Do you get frustrated when somebody actually tells you how they're doing when you ask them? No. <laughs> You're lying. It depends on how long it takes. <laughs> <laughs> that I believe. Yes. That's, that's much more than the truth sometimes, right? But yeah, are we willing? You know, sometimes in situations like this, I have to actually have to ask people, okay, you know, 
uh, I asked you to briefly share, right? <laughs> but but when we're when we're in relationship and we do have some time, what would it mean if we sacrificially? Isn't it a sacrifice sometimes to actually sit and listen with our hearts and really be concerned about what's going on with them? But when someone does that with us, how do we feel? Oh, I feel in, like just taken in. Loved. It's joy. Loved. It's love. It's belonging. Right? Because we all want our hearts to be able to be shared with others and for others to receive our hearts and receive who we are. Doesn't mean they're going to say yes to everything that we're saying. Right? So I really feel like I'm an idiot today. I'm probably, if I know someone and they, I'm a good friend of theirs and they say that, I'm probably going to gently encourage them in that area. Right? But we need to learn to do this. Take an, a sincere interest in under, understanding and knowing the other person. Listen, ask questions, reflect. When I was at Cornell as an undergrad, I had a whole course in reflective listening. A whole semester of learning how to reflectively listen. Do you know how many women were in that course? I went to the College of Human Ecology, which used to be called the College of Home Economics. So you did the only thing. And so there were a lot of women, you know, learning human development and family studies and social work and education. Well, there were, more, there were some men in the education courses, but they split us up into groups. They had us videotaping each other, learning how to listen to the other person and actually reflect back to them what they were saying so that they knew they, they were heard because then they felt it, they understood that. Someone was really with them. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a lot of what introductory counseling is all about. And people make jokes about it, you know. Because, oh, so, how do you feel? Well, what I hear you saying is, <laughs> right? You know, we make all these jokes about it. But do you know what a huge therapeutic bond is built just by doing that? Do you know what, what, what a huge bond is built of love with you, with people that you do that with? You may think I'm, I'm being theatrical here, but I'm not. No. I would, would you say the reason it's is because there's so little of it in our culture? It's like diamonds. It's rare. It's made rare. It's become rare, and, and, and when we say it's been made rare, I think it's been made rare. Well, why do you think it's been made rare? Lack of real technology. Lack of real community technology. Yeah. Okay. Focus attention. Focus of, of attention. Ability to focus yeah. and to give ourselves, which which uh, technology and our, our reliance on it has uh, decreased. I think a lot of us, uh, I think most people want to be heard as opposed to listen. So ego, narcissism, selfishness, infancy level of emotional maturity. We're just not comfortable enough in our own skin to actually take on somebody else's garden. Security, security. When someone starts, I, I have literally seen this happen. I've been with other people, and, and someone says, Sam, how are you doing? And you can tell that they're downcast, right? The person that's being asked that question. They start to share, and they're sharing deeply, and they start to cry, and the other person just, mm-hmm. up comes the fear bond. Yeah. Hello? They're getting triggered, aren't they? Probably. Right? Something about what's going on. How many, as we're going through our process, those of us who are fathers, and our kids are going through stages where we got hurt or didn't get the help that we needed? How easy is that for us to be there for them? To really listen to their hearts? It's really difficult. But if this happens in community and you guys understand this, like you can start to go deeper with each other. You say, what's going on right here, Bruce? I, uh, in, in, in terms of <clears throat> conversing with someone, I, I, I've used the word synchronized yeah. as, a, as a, uh, a, a terminology. And I think in this group, uh, we under, uh, understand synchronization in, in a mechanical form. But it also happens on an emotional level. 
And so when, when, when you interact with someone, you're actually, in the, in the early part of the conversation, you're synchronizing with them so that you're establishing trust and relationship so that you can, so that you can move forward in the conversation and really hear each other. And, and that's, a, that's a good term that I haven't brought out, but is used in the life model. And it's something that's used by geeky neurobiologists, and it, it refers to synchronization is this, is this technical term that really refers to our ability to connect. And to, we, when we're young, one of the ways that we learn, like this stuff is not taught to our kids. They catch it from us. Our kids catch maturity from us, and they catch it through that six cycles of second joy that's going on. It's not only because my brain is synchronized because I've got a, 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 a significant level of maturity, <clears throat> but it's also synchronizing their brains when mine's, mine's synchronized. How can you tell when your brain's synchronized? I'm able to stay the same, I'm able to stay Dave under pressure. And when I can do that, and I can relate to you or my children, then I can help bring synchrony for you. And I can bring synchrony between us. And it's a, it's a remarkable thing. I know it sounds geeky, but it's really talking about what we've been talking about already. I think what it says to me is, and I can relate to this, I think that my words have a lot of effect impact on people. But what I forget most of the time is that my nonverbal body language, my eye contact, your spirit, my spirit is 90% of communication. It's huge.
It's the author? Dr. Ben Mogi, a man from the Amen. I mean, yeah, I'm yeah. Serious. Yeah, some of you saw the uh, the um, teaching I did on a Sunday morning about, oh, this was three or four years ago, and I actually showed pictures of the brain, and that's from amenclinics.com. The spec. The spec the images. Yeah, and they, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second if you remind me. I want to ask, because uh, it's so prevalent, are you going to talk about Facebook and it's like, and social media and its role in all of this? Because <laughs> it's, it's really prevalent and a lot it of is. relationships are being formed and maintained yeah. over. Yeah, and over broken. Day, like it's, and broken. It's normal today, right? Well, there's a, there's a, a huge amount of uh, unfaithfulness that occurs for some people through uh, social media. But that, that's the easiest way to answer that is to put it in the context of what we're talking about in terms of emotional maturity. So for me, I'll just, you know, because I've explained that I, I had a, a sexual addiction, um, where does that come from? Well, if you look at the book, uh, the Life Model book, and you look at the, uh, the chart in it, it's really cool. They've got it very well set out. So you can look, and I can see here that, and it was pointed out to me, that I didn't know what satisfied them. Look, if you're on Facebook all the time, I was going to do a CBC Radio 1 uh, announcer who's 41 years old. She has notifications set on her iPhone so that she's always getting beeps right from Facebook and every, everything else. Not just texts and emails, but right from her social media. So Twitter account and Facebook's going off all the time. This gal's an announcer. She can't turn it off even when she's in the studio. <laughs> she's 41 years old. Just think of your kids, your grandkids. Just think of some of you out here. Sorry, but you know, it's true, right? Well, what's the problem? We don't know what satisfies us. Amen. No, don't come quick. Give the church time to grow up and become a spotless bride. Amen. I'd like to see all the stones. I'd like to see. No, I mean it. You know, like, we need to grow up, don't we? That's why I came here. That's why I'm doing this book, is because I need to grow up, and you guys need to grow up, and if we don't get together and start talking about this stuff, we aren't going to grow up. To be, uh, to be totally honest, I, when you say grow up, my first feeling is I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to, right? I mean, I said that, and I don't want to, but I know that my goal, I'm going to continue hurting all the people that I love the most, right? I'm going to continue hurting my wife and my children. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah, I think that last one was a good note to end on, honestly. I really do. Well, it starts with unity because you want to truly believe that these denominational divisions need to end. Well, that's brokenheartedness on a church level. Yes. yes. It's brokenheartedness on a, on, there's brokenheartedness in us, but if there's brokenheartedness in us, there's going to be brokenheartedness in the church, too. The church is going to be broken up and segmented, right? Take a look at Romans 15. Take a look at Romans 15. I was going to talk a little bit about that this morning, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do you. We've had a lot of fun this summer. Yeah. We spent 16 weeks, eight Eight sessions, two hours each session, and we had a hard time keeping it to two hours. Yeah. And we saw really cool stuff happen. Yeah. Uh, it might be something you want to consider. It might be something you want to consider. It was awesome. I love it. Yeah. It's awesome. Cool. So, yeah, I think just sort of to, to wrap things up, I think that we've, uh, we've all seen it, that uh, we need to grow. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of us have been trying to do that on, on our own. Some of us have been doing some of that on our own. And some of us have been doing that in small groups and that sort of thing. But I just really think that, this, um, that what we're talking about here, um, right, there's a lot more to talk about. And, uh, well, yeah, and, but, but really get together and discuss with guys. Um, obviously, we can't do it right now. Um, I think this is something of great value for us and our families and our community.
really, really strong for me. Um, I want to grow. You know, I don't want to stay um, at the place I'm at. in that direction. I really don't think so. I have seven kids. I wouldn't be doing them and my wife, I wouldn't be doing them justice or service not going in this direction. Um, and then also, you know, my brothers around me and my friends and those in the community that we are in. So we, need, we can look on our own personal level. We can look on our family level. We can also look the church and our, our family, our, our community, we're talking about bringing people, bringing people up and moving forward together. Um, they, will, they will know us because of our mature love. <laughs> sure, yeah, absolutely. And so um, I think that, I think this is a big part of that too, who we are and what our vision is as the, the Cambridge Vineyard, really. Being able to being able to do that, bring guys in to a place that's a little more whole, you know, and going in the right direction. So, anyway, I mean, uh, I really, I really would say, yeah. I mean, Dave's got a Dave's got a sign up sheet. Um, I really, honestly, guys, I really, honestly think that there's there's great value here. I would encourage you guys to there's really consider value. to really consider, um, you know, whatever it is. It's, cost of time, it's a cost of money, and it's a cost of your emotional being there. Um, but you know what, there's a lot of things that we see as valuable that we say, you know what, this is valuable. I'm going to spend something on this because it brings value. And we all know that. So I would say there's great value here. I, I, does anybody see like anybody see that there's value here and there's something there's, there's a place to come here. Great value. So the thing is, is there's a money and everything else kind of by the time you get the fourth week, you realize that that money really is nothing. The value you get out of this day is amazing. Why you it is also painful. I, I don't want to sell this. Uh, I, I, well, and you guys can do that, but what there is is an opportunity. So if you if you want the opportunity, we're starting on uh, Tuesday, uh, sorry, on Monday after Thanksgiving. It's the 20th at 7:30. Um, it's it's around 100, 120.